A very warm welcome to the Turn of Artists Researchers Day. My name is Clement Krieft. I'm a researcher from the Faculty of Pharmacy at the University of Ljubljana and at the Santos Development Center. And hello also from my side. Hello to everyone in your homes and offices. I am Matea Kramer, Associate Director and TRD Academic Network Lead in Technical Research and Development Biologics and Cell and Gene Therapies. So we as Novartis are one of the largest pharmaceutical companies and we have academia collaboration all around the world. Our mission is how we can foster collaboration with academic partners. And in order to foster this mission together with academic partners, we are identifying the sweet spots, disclose our needs, and we find the joint areas where our needs are able to meet academic research. And we have on a call today, a lot of passionate scientists from small and large molecules in Novartis that will share some brilliant examples of joint academia industry collaboration efforts and successes. In total, we will listen to six interesting 15 minute presentations on the topic of data and digitalization, automatization and biologics development. Each presentation will also end with a short Q&A session. So in case you have any questions for our speakers, feel free to post them in the chat. But first, let's kick off the event by inviting Dr. Daria Fercete Meliuto, Head of Strategic Programs in Novartis for some introductory words. Daria made many academic collaborations possible and she continues to foster brilliant relations with our academic partners. Daria, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Clem, and thank you, Matea, for a nice opening. So I am really honored to have the opportunity to welcome you all at this special occasion. When we uh, gathered, uh, where we come together already for the third time in a row to celebrate science, innovation, and collaboration between industry and academia. For us in Novartis, this year is additionally special because we celebrate 75 years of Blick, 25 years of Novartis, and 15 years since we at Sando have offered the first biosimilar drug product to the patients as the first company in the globe. Many of our achievements all along the timeline come from sustainable collaboration with academia. And this is what we are especially proud on. Proud and thankful to our universities, research institute and faculties, professors, students and researchers that worked so hard and so smart and kept pushing the limits of science and practice to the sky and higher. Even the COVID pandemic couldn't reduce our engagement. On contrary, we have strengthened our ties to best serve our purpose and patience. All along the way, we have been generating new solutions, concepts and technologies, fostering new competencies and supporting economic growth. All along this way, open innovation ecosystem has been growing, embracing always new partners, also in the field of entrepreneurship. Collaborations are needed on all different levels, also interdisciplinary and internationally, including also wider social environment and regulators. All together, we shall provide prosperous working and living environment for the best talents to stay connected. Go get professional experience abroad, but also return home at a certain point. Digitalization keeps accelerating new developments exponentially, calling for constant need to update our knowledge reskill and upskill, develop new ways of thinking and working. Lifelong learning and continuous education are our privilege 
and responsibility. And all this again underlines the importance of academia industry collaboration. And now I am really excited to invite you to enter today's agenda that brings some brilliant examples of shared projects in developing new science and scientists. I wish you a successful and inspirational day. Thank you. Thank you, Daria, very much for this warm introduction. Um, for the next session, I would like to invite Dr. Luca Peternil, Head of Pharmaceutical Development, Dr. Biljana Jankovic, Head of IVIVC Group, both from the Santos Development Center, and Professor Dr. Rug Drill, Vice Dean for Scientific Research from the Faculty of Pharmacy. Luca will first speak about the scope and goals of our numerous academic collaborations. In addition, Biljana and Professor Drill will recognize a special achievement between Novartis in Slovenia and the Faculty of Pharmacy. Luca, please. Thank you, Clement. Yeah. <clears throat> hi, Biljana. Hi, Rok. Um, I would say that we uh, actually have a very, very good uh, historical track record of collaborations with academia. Um, and I think that we also need to look a bit broader. So let's say out of, outside of, uh, let's say, our regular uh, uh, scope, uh, which in my case is pharmaceutical sciences. Um, and with that, we ac actually developed very good uh, innovations in the past. For example, one of them uh, was uh, artificial stomach, which is uh, uh, applied on a regular basis uh, in our laboratories. But I would really like to take this opportunity and uh, <clears throat> so invite uh, with that Billion and Rock. Uh, they will uh, present one of very, very good collaboration between uh, Development Center Ljubljana and Faculty of Pharmacy. Um, so uh, thanks to both of you already now, and maybe Biljana, you can start and then we'll continue. So um, looking forward to, to some of your words, yeah, and uh, thank you. Biljana. Excuse me, I was on the mute. Um, thank you, Luca, for a nice introduction. Um, so what we would like um, to discuss today and a give a recognition is actually our pre-formulation um, incubator. Um, this was somehow idea to um, improve the strategic network collaboration between the Lake Sando and faculty of uh, pharmacy in the field of pre-formulation studies um, actually of the small molecules. So we wanted to join the scientific expertise um, also, in the previous period, we have very trusted uh, collaboration with, between these two um, uh, institutes. And of course, to have one competent operating model, uh, which actually um, express its benefit uh, now in the COVID um, uh, period, where we have really uh, very fast execution of the literature overviews. Uh, characterization of the APIs as well as the reverse engineering activities. And beyond that, we also wanted to promote the knowledge exchange, uh, which is actually needed uh, to um, or to have business um, um, sustainability and, of course, to modernize uh, the academic approaches. So I'm very happy um, that we actually obtained this Novartis Star Award for uh, pre-formulation incubator and maybe to invite Rogdeo um, to actually reflect from the academic point of view this type of collaboration. Yes, so uh, <clears throat> we are quite happy that we have such strong collaboration with the uh, Lake Novartis uh, company. So, and therefore we were very honored when Lake Novartis employees nominated us and voted for the recognition of Novartis Star in the category of external partner. And this category was awarded for the first time this year. Uh, this recognition is certainly an incentive for further cooperation in the already established areas of pre-formulation incubator that was described the earlier and the human resources development project, uh, which is an ongoing project for, for several years. Uh, and this could be also an, an incentive for the potential establishment of new areas of cooperation. Of course, we are also additionally pleased to be recognized by Novartis Star as LEC has been a long-term strategic 
strategic partner of the Faculty of Pharmacy, uh, contributing to the development of the faculty's educational programs and the growth of its staff, those who leave the faculty for industry and those who remain with us. Uh, the award uh, confirms the long-term orientation of the faculty, that only the academic environment that is open to solving the real professional challenges remains competitive and in the service of the society. Uh, the collaboration with Lake undoubtedly enriches us and is, in our opinion, an excellent example of value-added collaboration between an industrial partner and academic institutions. So we are lo looking forward to future collaborations. So thank you. Yeah, uh, I mean, thank you both uh, to Bilian as a leader from our end, uh, Santo Development Center, and Rock to you. So looking forward also to future uh, great collaboration. Yeah? So thanks uh, to both of you and uh, Clement. Thank you. Thank you all for your wonderful talks. Um, I'm convinced that our collaboration will continue to flourish in the future. And in this slide, we are now continuing with one of the amazing collaborations between the Faculty of Pharmacy and Novartis in Slovenia. Uh, for the first presentation, I would like to invite Dr. Rebecca Jerip scientist in clinical development and professor Dr. Albin Kristel, head of the chair of biopharmaceutics and uh, pharmacokinetics from the faculty of pharmacy. Rebecca and professor Kristel will speak about modeling and LADME predictive analytics and of course the dynamics of our collaboration. Uh, Rebecca, professor Kristel, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you uh, for these nice words. Uh, I will start with the presentation of our uh, joint project. Just a second. Um, I hope it's okay. Yes. Is it okay? Thank you. Um, just a moment, yeah, well, uh, I will have a few words on the human resources development project between LEC and uh, Faculty of Pharmacy. For the introduction, I would uh, just briefly uh, like to mention the speciality of this project, which comes out from our differences. Uh, there are significant differences between academy and industry as shown on this very slide. Uh, our common field is the part here in between where new general knowledge is binding with innovation and reflects the entrepreneurship. This aspect, which represents a strategic long-term cooperation with our two uh, institutions, is one of the key features of the Human Resources Development Project, which also defines some organizational aspects of this very project. Uh, on the next slide, 3D and D to power of Mr. three. Crystal, I'm, so, yeah? I'm so sorry, just to uh, interrupt you. Uh, the slides are not visible in, in the, the whole slides are not visible. So if you can try to uh, turn them, turn them down and or turn turn the off turn off the share screening and try again because we don't see the the whole slide. Sorry. I'll try again if uh, it will work. Is this better? It is. Okay. Um, so uh, here we stopped. Uh, so I think uh, 3D uh, means uh, education, science, and uh, innovation. While uh, D to power three, of course, is drug discovery and development. 
combined giving combined together of course giving uh, the best results uh, this cooperation represents the added value uh, for both partners uh, here we focused on presenting faculty expertise throughout the life cycle of the medicament from uh, the idea uh, research on target models of active substances and mechanism of action, including laboratory diagnostic, development of delivery systems, technological manufacturing, quality assurance, supply consulting to post marketing and uh, pharmacovigilance. Uh, some project characteristics are shown on this uh, slide. Well, the project focuses on concrete issues of development and improvement of the financier, which is in this case, of course, lack. The young researcher is employed at our faculty, at Faculty of Pharmacy University, works mainly in an industrial environment works mostly with form mentors, thus also getting used to the complexity of relationships uh, in the workplace and gaining pedagogical experience, while also entering uh, the, while also enrolling in doctoral studies. These young researchers are excellent workers and after PhD normally always employed at LEC researching skill and efficiency of the candidate as well as of co-workers are thus increased. Uh, if we go further, uh, we have some other properties of the project. Uh, this kind of project enables more controlled publishing of scientific papers. On the other hand, it also enables more complex and longer term cooperation, as well as faster adaptation of young researchers to real employment conditions. And about added value of the projects is in the development of various competences, not only on the part of the young researcher, but also on the part of the mentors or coordinators of the individual project as shown on this slide. And finally, I would like to show the beneficial uh, achievement for both companies. Here, cooperation represents added value for both partners in several areas and in both directions. In the transfer of knowledge, skills and experience in human resources and in the professional development of the individual and institutions for better medicines and better care for patients. Thank you. Any questions? Maybe? I think I will continue with the presentation and then we will have the ah, questions. Sorry. Okay, I will go. Oh, uh, oh, wait, uh, stop sharing. Thank you, sorry, Rebecca. <laughs> okay, I will continue with the presentation. So, um, hello everyone, I'm Rebecca. Um, I was uh, um, participant in this project that Professor Crystal mentioned, and he was actually my mentor. Um, my, the title of the doctoral thesis on which I worked on during this project was development and application of physiologically based pharmacokinetic models for evaluation of influences on drug bioavailability and bioequivalence prediction. I would like to just shortly introduce you into the topic of my uh, thesis. So I was dealing with in silico modeling of LADME processes, so liberation, absorption, 
distribution, metabolism, and elimination of drug substance after drug product administration. We can use simple compartment models to describe this, such as the one seen here, where we can see that the dose is administered into the central compartment, it um, distributes to the peripheral compartment, and then eliminates. Using mathematical equations, we can use this model to predict or describe plasma concentration profiles versus time for a specific drug substance. On contrary, physiologically based pharmacokinetic models are something similar but more complex. They account for physiological and anatomical properties of organisms, such as vol volume of fluid in the stomach, the transit time through the gastrointestinal tract, and so on. They also account for physical chemical and biopharmaceutic properties of the drug product and the active uh, pharmaceutical ingredient, such as the solubility at different pH, the API particle size, the permeability of the API. They are mechanistic models and a uh, representation of one kind of this model can be seen here on the right. So you can see that gastrointestinal tract is divided in several compartments. In each of those compartments, the drug substance can be unreleased, undissolved, dissolved, or then absorbed. And for the describing the distribution within the um, body, we can use simple compartment models, or we can use full PBBK models with a number of organs such as muscles, liver, um, respiratory tract with a specified blood volume and the permeability of the drug into those compartments. And again, we use these complex models also to predict plasma concentration profiles for the specific drug substance. Why are we interested in these models in generic industry? Um, here are some examples on which I also focused during my research work. So we were interested in differences between formulations, between test and reference formulations, uh, first of all, to evaluate bioequivalence between the test and reference formulations, since the bioequivalence is the primary goal in our generic industry. We were also interested if we can evaluate the effect of dissolution specification on in vivo behavior of drugs. And we were also interested in the food effect on the bioavailability and how it can affect the bioequivalence of the test and reference drug. And uh, the last part was focused on in vivo variability we can observe in, um, in our clinical studies. During the first time, I've developed a PBPK model to predict the differences between formulations since our formulation had, uh, the test formulations had API in amorphous form and uh, reference formulations had the API in the crystalline form, we were able to incorporate these differences in, a, in the model and also to predict the differences we could observe in vivo. We also published a research article in the cooperation, of course, with the uh, Faculty of Pharmacy. The second point I mentioned before was we were interested to set clinically relevant dissolution specification using the developed models. One of those models was used here, for example, to evaluate if this slower dissolution at the first time point has any impact on the in vivo behavior. And here we can see that the model predicted no significant difference in the CMEX and AOC and those this would be established as a safe space for this formulation. This, this was also regulatory accepted, and we again published a research article with this topic. The third part of my uh, research was evaluating the food effect on the bioequivalence and bioequivalence in the fed state. We've developed several models, and our idea is to go into um, discussion with regulatory agencies to discuss, discuss if they would be able to waive FED bioequivalence studies based on just the, the modeling as it is presented here. Um, the six cases we've developed are also described in this research article, which was published. And the last part, as I said, was to evaluate uh, if the models could be used to somehow um, evaluate the impact of intersubject 
differences in the gastrointestinal tract physiology on drug in vivo behavior. For instance, you can see here how the small intestinal transit time affects the in vivo Tmax or Cmax if it is changing within those limits. And again, um, those kind of research was published in another article um, in the Journal of Pharmaceutical Sciences. So to briefly conclude, the PBPK models could be used in the generic industry. They are being used in the drug development, and we are um, always trying to see how they could be used also for regulatory purposes. And the use of PBPK modeling could lead to decreased number of clinical studies being performed and thus to decrease development time of drug products and decreased cost of the these products, which could all lead to faster and more affordable generic medicines being um, applied on the market. I would just like to acknowledge the IVIVC and clinical development at LIG. Igor and Irnea were my mentors at the, um, Novartis, and at the University of Ljubljana, my mentors were Dr. Uh, Professor Albin Kristal and Professor Simon Jacques. Now I would thank you for listening and uh, if we have any questions. Clemen. Uh, thank you, Rebecca and Professor Krista. This was very insightful and interesting. Um, maybe first, Rebecca, I would, I would start with a question. So um, you've talked about a lot um, about regulatory agencies and speaking with them to knowledge some of your models but on the other hand your research was also partly academic and focused on your phd so i was just wondering how much are this um, is this modeling actually used for product development in uh, sando development center or novartis in general um with regards to the Santos Development Center in Ljubljana, I can say we use it in our development for making internal decisions. And we also use it for um, some justifications with the regulatory agencies um, all over the world with the US FDA in EMA in Europe and also Chinese FDA, Australian FDA and so on. So we do use them and the agencies are also looking forward to that. But the they are not accepting all over, so we have a lot to, of work to do. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, for the time's sake, I would continue with the next presentation and give it over to Matea at this point. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So I will share my screen. Do you see? Yes, yes we, we can see it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so today we will share also some wonderful examples of joint academia industry collaboration from biologics and cell and gene therapies in Mingesh. And uh, so I would start with the first one. So the Chamber of Commerce and Industry bestow this year the Golden Award to the project automation of processes in analytical laboratory for biosimilar development. Within this project, we implemented several automated analytical processes, which enable us to analyze more samples in a shorter period of time. The project was developed by TRD, Biologics and Cell and Gene Therapies Mingesh, in collaboration with the Faculty of Electrical Engineering of the University of Ljubljana. Uh, so I would invite Dr. Dylan Widmar and Professor Dr. Matthias Michel to present uh, their work. Thank you, Matea, for this introduction. Uh, yes, in the next few minutes, I will take you through the lab automation. Uh, which was established over the last few years in our development environment. In general, automation is well known in connection to production or manufacturing process, uh, but in the last decades, it's also connected in development area and uh, we're covering the routine part of development. And this is also uh, our, our scope, uh, the scope of our presentation. Uh, yeah, let's start with the agenda. Uh, within this presentation, I will go through those topics um, 
in the beginning, I will present who we are and what is uh, our scope. Um, then uh, what is laboratory automation in analytical development? Later, I will show you one example of automation of analytical method and then concluding thoughts. Uh, automation is uh, one of our new technology pillar, which is tightly connected with digitalization, it's data and digital data mining. But digitalization, this is another pillar and it is out of the scope of today's presentation. So uh, why and when automation? Um, why autom automate some methods? Uh, it's very important to uh, automate because we can get a very high precision and reproducibility results from analytical methods. One of the most crucial point is automation. Of automation is, uh, of course, fast analytics and higher efficiency, uh, which means more sample in less time. By automation, uh, also sample storage, sample identification, logistics are facilitated. Uh, within this context, it is tightly, connect, tightly connected with data and digital. Miniaturization is also one of the aspect. Uh, we uh, see many benefits in the reagent consum consumption, in sample consumption, and also there is a lot of positive effects on uh, environment. Uh, another thing is uh, when we do automation, when we have a lot of samples, very long lasting and complex method, and uh, when we combine sample preparation with analytical methods. Uh, here I have in mind end-to-end -end analytics, so uh, from sample preparation, preparing input data for analysis to random analysis and data evaluation. and. Uh, at the end, what is the benefit? The benefit is the release people or operators from routine work to higher added value activities and to support their uh, growth. Next slide, please. Uh, in our analytical development in Mengesh, which is a LIC group, part of Novartis, uh, we have uh, eight uh, robotic systems which um, are uh, located in Mengesh and each uh, instrument is uh, automated liquid handling system has his own uh, configuration uh, and his own modules in, in, in the configuration. So the core of uh, aut such automation system is um, liquid handling, liquid pipetting arm and robotic manipulator arms, which enables to first to pipette uh, different volume from 0 0.5 to 1000 microliters from different positions, from different wells on the platform. And uh, the, the, um, um, the, the scope of, of robotic manipulator arms is transfer those plates to different instruments which are connected within a robotic system. Uh, we have established such system to expand um, knowledge over all operators who are working in a lab. Uh, with other words, we actually do here a giant step from ma manual pipette to automated liquid handling system. Uh, as I mentioned before, each uh, platform have, uh, has a sp have a specific configuration for specific task, uh, generally uh, yeah, containing a channel or uh, 96 channel pipetting arm, incubator, cycler, centrifuge, vial capper, chromatography stations, and also high throughput analytical devices. Next slide, please. Uh, so here I listed some of the uh, fully automated analytical methods. And uh, if you go very briefly through, through all this, uh, first is small scale protein A purification or immunoaffinity purification. Uh, here we have established a system which is um, integrated chromatography station and we can uh, do chromatography separation, aliquotation, aliquoting, and analyzing uh, UV content at the end of the purification process. So this process is fully automated without human intervention during the process. The same is for ELISA. Uh, ELISA we are using in our department for uh, impurities, and we have um, such a system which enables us to work up to five 
plates at the same time, 596 well plates in the same time. Another is high throughput content measurement um, and uh, sample desalting and concentrate, uh, concentrating. Here I would like uh, to expose that here we, put a lot, here we put a lot of our internal knowledge to develop a special insert and special holders for Amicon tubes, uh, and we, uh, which uh, enables us to fully, automate, to fully automate this process. Uh, high throughput capillary electrophoresis on lab chip, I will um, spend some minutes uh, later on. On the other side, I have uh, some. I have listed some of the um, uh, automation sample of sample preparation. Not the whole method, but only the sample preparation. This is glycan mat mapping method and peptide mapping and all other HPLC excipients and other methods. So th these are a very complex method and. Uh, sample prep are taking more than a few hours so we put all this sample on the robotic system and here we save a lot of actually fts and costs next slide please thank you uh, i will sh show you here on uh, one example um, of um, collaboration with academia uh, but the first I would share with you some background. Um, so uh, we, uh, I will hear reporting about uh, automation method for protein aggregation and fragmentation analytics, because we have uh, uh, really increasing needs for this uh, analytics in our technical development, uh, because we have to uh, control the, our process, which are Taking, which are taking place in downstream and upstream development. So this method it's, has a very long lasting manual sample preparation, pipetting, adding different reagents, centrifugation, incubation, and so on. Uh, nevertheless, the high, the, this method, analytical method is high throughput, but um, here is really problematic, uh, this um, sample preparation. Next slide, please, Matea. Yes, so, to do this automation, we have to first fulfill some requirements. The first is um, move from tube to 96 well plate format. This uh, was done very easily by our internal knowledge. And we also established a fully automated sample prep on uh, liquid handling system for reducing and non-reducing condition. And we also implemented, uh, in, in, do implement, implemented the in centrifugation and incubation process. But what was the main issue is to connect two different machines. One is um, TICAN, um, which means uh, liquid handling system with analytical instrument, which is in this case lab chip. So here we need hardware and software drivers. But the problem here was that those drivers and those connection was not available on the market. So we are uh, looking here for the custom-made solution, and um, we uh, are contact. We contacted our uh, colleagues from Faculty of Electrical Engineering, the group of robotics, which is led by Matthias, Professor Dr. Matthias Mikkel. Uh, they helped us to establish this communication, which based on uh, client server communication. So that was one of the way how do we uh, connect TICAN with lab chip instrument and establish those communications. And the result was a fully automated process with uh, increasing uh, walk away time of, of, of our operators. And what is all Im important that all relevant data uh, for analysis is imported at the beginning of the process and without human, the process runs with, without human intervention during the process. Um, yeah, the collaboration was uh, really great, and uh, yeah, we we are also looking for 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 further collaboration on this field. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, to conclude, um, I would like to emphasize the scope of lab automation. Uh, automation in such way enables us to support uh, more drug development uh, project at the same time, enhance precision and re reproducibility, reduce sample con consumption, and release people from routine work. Our future vision is uh, further increased operator work walk away times, uh, continuous improvement. Here I have in mind introduction and establishing of the state of the art technology into our processes, and of course what is the most important is to further collaborate with academia. Um, after all, we strive to build tools that are thoughtful, convenient, and empowering 
to push our pace of development forward. Uh, at the end, I would like to share uh, with you our accomplishment. With such automation setup, we are awarded by Silver National Award of uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry of Slovenia. And we, have, we are very proud of such uh, external praise, uh, which gives us an additional motivation in our automation journey. So thank you very much. And if you have any question, please ask. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dylan, for this really nice presentation and congratulations again. Uh, so question from my side, uh, how many people are actually using this robotic system? Yes, uh, yeah, it was a um, good question. Yeah, we expand this knowledge and expertise and we are onboarding all our employees who are working in labs and the number is right now around 50, 15 employees mm -hmm. okay uh, so it's quite a big yeah. number and it's then often yes. used so it's yes uh it is we are using this system very often on actually on daily basis we are using okay. six robotic system and two on a weekly basis mm -hmm. so it's really fully occupied okay thank you very much i don't know any questions so. from the audience Otherwise, we are just on time. I would proceed with uh, second presentation. Th thank you very much, um, Tilan. Thank you too. So, thank you too. And now we continue with the second topic. Yeah. Um, so uh, we are continuing with um, second presentation and Dr. Andrei Pocher is a senior expert science and technology in bioprocess technologies in Mingus. And he will present his project together with assistant professor Dr. Blas Likozar from National Institute of Chemistry. So Andrei and Blas, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Um, also, Andras Polišić is here, who is um, actively participating in the project. Um, and I will continue with the next slide. So I will present some cooperation between uh, Lake and National Institute of Chemistry. Specifically, this is Department D13, Department of Catalysis and Chemical Reaction Engineering. Head of the department is Blaž Likozar and it is a chemical engineering department. It's dealing with chemical process engineering, reactor and unit operation, design and construction, also with multi-scale process modeling and the biopharmaceutical processes. The reaction topics are uh, develop, uh, developing the reaction mechanisms, obtaining uh, chemical kinetics and the transfer phenomenon, also the thermodynamics and fluid dynamics, and we have had cooperation with um, the departments of uh, uh, biopharmaceuticals and also small molecules. Here on the picture is an example of uh, chromatography. And uh, we've done also a lot of cooperation with crystallizations in small molecules. Uh, next slide. So I will talk about uh, uh, computational fluid dynamics and mechanistic modeling of bioreactors. So if we start with the computational fluid dynamics, first we need to have the uh, generation of geometry for which uh, we use CAD software, that's computer-aided design, in order to produce the uh, geometries. Uh, some of the geometries need to be uh, made according to mathematical rules. And also, of course, the most important um, the important element inside the bioreactor is, is the blade. So special care must be taken to assure that the blade is um, drawn correctly. Next slide. For uh, calculations and meshing, we are using OpenFOAM. So this is open source, source software, software. It's basically a, a toolbox with C++ solvers for uh, numerical solutions for continuum mechanics. So the procedure is that we, from the geometries, we need to obtain the SDLs. This is stereolithography format, which OpenFOAM uses. And then we mesh the solution uh, of our geometry in order to get the computational domain. Next. 
In the pre-processing, we need to define the boundary conditions, the fluid properties, the turbulent model, which we will use, and the rotating region. So the whole solution is done in the Linux, uh, in the terminal. Uh, the pre-processing I was showing before, we need to construct the geometry, and then we solve the turbulent Reynolds, the average navier stokes equations with appropriate solvers. After that, we uh, use a lot of post-processing operations in order to obtain all of the results we are interested in, which is the uh, velocity field and the pressure field, also the, the turbulent kinetic energy and its dissipation. The Reynolds numbers, power input, mixing time requires an additional solution of the mass transfer equations for the tracer test. Uh, pumping capacity, shear rates, and uh, also the streamlines. Uh, in the end, we have automatic report generation, so we try to automate as much of the operation as possible. Next slide. Uh, the bioreactor, as we can see on this picture of the right, is actually very complicated. So it is operated in transient operation. We have feeding of substrates. It is a two-phase system uh, with gas and liquid and also cells and uh, substrates. So actually it's free three-phase system. Um, if we look at the basic reactor concepts, which are the engineering ones, the batch reactor, uh, or can be operated in fat batch mode also, the continuous third reactor, plug flow reactor, and the plug flow reactor with actual dispersion. All of these basic uh, reactor concepts can be found and we are using them to simulate our bioreactor. So as I already mentioned for the operation, which is very complex, we also have sparger flows, we have overlay, overlay flows, we have gas bubbles, which have a different constitution. Then we have all of the regulation of the feeding, mixing, dissolved oxygen, pH, and temperature, which all need to be accounted for. Next slide. Um, one thing we need to model is, of course, the headspace. Uh, it depends, the total mass balance depends on the feeding rate and also on the sampling rate, which also needs to be acknowledged. We have the overlay gas, sparger gas, and then the outlet gas constitution and the mass transfer rate, which takes uh, place across the surface of the, of the bioreactor uh, medium. Uh, in this case, we need to determine the KLA of the surface, which is the mass transfer coefficient. Uh, it will depend on the power input, uh, or power per volume, uh, depending on the volume of our uh, reactor. And this is a value which we obtain with computational fluid dynamics. The other thing is it depends also on the sparging rate, which depends on the uh, regulation of all of the all of our critical uh, parameters in the reactor. Um, the KLA surface is very important also for scale up and scale down configurations because uh, in small reactors this will have effect. We will have, see the effect of the overlay gas and the mass transfer through the surface. While at larger reactors, this is not so prominent, and most of the most of the mass transfer. Uh, takes place through the bubbles uh, which come through the sparger at the bottom of the reactor. Next slide. So for the um, uh, for the balance of the of the reactor, uh, we have um, mass transfer through the bubbles and through the headspace. We need to acknowledge the dilution uh, because of the feed or pure feeding substrates, uh, the feeding. Uh, we know we have to know the oxygen uptake rate in the case of oxygen mass balance and the CO2 evolution rate in case of CO2. So we know also the respiratory quotient. It is for the uh, short cells which we are using is around one. Uh, we need to add the reactions. The first reactions which are most important are the uh, dissolution of uh, carbon dioxide and all of the reactions which take place after that. Also here we have the buffer system, which needs to be added uh, in, because we have, of course, a buffer, buffer solution, which will uh, affect the changes of pH. Now the mass transfer uh, takes place according to the Whitman film theory. So our bubbles have some uh, constitution of, inside of the partial pressures of our components, which are oxygen, CO2, and nitrogen. Uh, this will, through the Henry's law, will uh, tell us what the equilibrium constitution is, and then the KLA will tell us the rate of the mass transfer exchange. So what we want to get is the mechanistic model, uh, so we can test different operational parameters. Also for that, we need the whole, um, or not the whole, but um, more the important parts of the cell biology, which will affect uh, our substrate consumption and, uh, for instance, the pH in our solution. 
And we also need to model the whole uh, PID control for oxygen, CO2, sodium hydroxide, and um, also the temperature. Uh, next slide. So I cannot show uh, exactly the solutions for the bioreactor. So here is the standard tank configuration. The solutions which, which we get are the shear rates, velocity, magnitude, streamlines, the power numbers, which are very important, and the mixing time. And also we have added now the bubble distribution, which can uh, tell us if the mixing is, um, let's say, uh, not uh, intense enough, then we cannot have a good bubble distribution inside our reactor. Next slide. And uh, maybe just quickly, um, this is uh, some preliminary simulations. We can look at this. It's very good for the validation of our model. So this is the first part. This is without the buffer solution. So we are testing uh, CO2 dissolution reactions and a PID control. So the initial conditions are only water with no dissolved gases and we are sparging with air. We can see on the top right graph the air constitution. Then we can calculate the gas constitution in the bubbles and then the dissolved gas constitution according to Henry's law and also one half equation, uh, which is the thermodynamic equilibrium. Uh, then we see the dissolving CO2 and the H plus ions, which will then give us in the end a pH of 5.65, which is exactly the pH of water equilibrated with air. Now, if we try gassing with uh, pure CO2, we will get a final pH of 3.9, which is in the range what we will find in literature for acid rain. So it is also validated uh, correct value. Now, if we try pH regulation, uh, so in this case, on the next slide, we have air, and then we have uh, pH regulation, sorry, on the image. So let's go back to the previous slide. On the, yes, you cannot see my mouse. I'm actually showing what I am talking about. So this is the bottom middle uh, middle figure. Um, so uh, if we put on uh, turn on pH regulation after two hours to 5.3, we have we see that we get a very fast response with the CO2 because we in this case we're using a one-dimensional model. And in the next case, in the on the right picture, if we uh, try pH regulation to 8.5 after two hours, we will see that we have not reached the uh, correct uh, pH, but we see that on the top uh, bottom right figure, we have uh, sodium hydroxide, which is being pumped. And we see that, both, that there is still an offset. So this is the exact thing that happens if in the PID regulation, we have only the proportional part and not, not integral part. So it is one of the things that we can look into. And in this case, we will just have to increase the integral part. Next slide. So again, I cannot show exactly the uh, results of the whole mechanistic model because it is um, um, project specific. Uh, we have a good agreement with the, um, with the models we're using for the viable cell density, which is on the middle graph. Uh, we have not yet added, added yet uh, the cell death because uh, we need some, uh, some good, uh, let's say, um, mechanistic, uh, mechanistic equations for this. Uh, we can check the volume after inoculation, also the uh, feeding and the sampling. And in this case, I'm just presenting the constitution of the headspace of the headspace gases. So we get all of the hydrodynamic conditions, we get all the solid profiles, all of the gas profiles, all of the metabolic profiles, which are not showing the biomass, and all of the control then we, which we can um, we can then uh, set for different operation. So what we get is the mechanistic digital twin, good for simulations, operational parameter determination, uh, trying different scenarios, like intensified operation or um, whatever is needed in a specific project. And in future work, there is still a lot to, uh, that has to be done, calibrate uh, for all scales and obtain the correct correlations for the transfer coefficients, which are of course uh, dependent on the gassing rates and on the power input. Uh, technology transfer and scale up outlook, this is maybe what we are using them uh, the most. Okay, thank you. If you have any questions. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, so a lot of work has been done really, so thank you. I have a question. So how uh, can the modeling results be used for scale up? Uh, yes, yeah, scale up is actually one of the most important things uh, along with the technology transfer because we are dealing with different reactor ge geometries. 
Um, one thing that we have found is that, uh, I mean, it is already well known, but still different strategies are being used that the power input is a very good scale up criterion. Uh, the power input will exactly ensure that we have um, also then the same gassing rate because those two will affect the mass transfer uh, of the of oxygen into the solution, which will have to uh, be compensated because of the, um, the oxygen uptake rate of, of the cells. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Do we have any question from the audience, from the participants? Otherwise, I would like to thank you, Andre, uh, again. Um, and uh, if, Clement, you agree, I would suggest that we continue with the presentations and maybe have more buffer at the end to discuss. Um, so with that, OK? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh -huh, okay. So then I would um, now... Uh, ask Grega Hrovac, Hrov, so, sorry. Uh, so this is the last presentation from Biologics Mingesh. So he is expert science and technology from drug product process development. And he will present another very important topic, modeling of downscale model design and parameters for filter validation. Uh, so in Novartis, we are at the cutting edge with this expertise and specific capabilities were gained in collaboration with Faculty of Mechanical Engineering, University of Maribor. So Professor Dr. Matyash Hribershek and Grega Hrovat, I hand over to you. Hello everyone, um, do you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm Grega Hrovat, expert science and technology, part of TRD DPD, like uh, already Mateja said. Uh, today I'm here with uh, Professor Dr. Matyash Hribershek, uh, Head of Process Engineering and Computational Fluid Dynamics Laboratory at Faculty of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Maribor. Uh, there is a history of our collaboration in filtration projects. So lately we collaborated in a project, uh, like Matea said, modeling of downscale model design and parameters for filter validation which will be presented today. The project started in December of 2019 and ended in September uh, this year. Uh, um, so long story short, uh, the filtration process is really important for us and to know as much as uh, we, we can about uh, filtration mechanisms and scalability of filters. So from laboratory scale to production scale, uh, in this project was building a model uh, which can calculate the energy intake uh, in filters while using continuous and intermittent flows. Uh, at this point, I would like to give a word to Matyash for deeper insight of a project. Please, Matyash. Thank you, Grega. Uh, warm welcome from Maribor. Uh, from Faculty of Mechanical Engineering. <clears throat> As uh, Greg already uh, in short uh, described, uh, we were uh, dealing with the problem of uh, modeling of, uh, let's say, a breakthrough phenomena or causes of breakthrough phenomena that uh, can uh, cause, uh, of course, contamination in the filtration uh, operation. And uh, typically, we are dealing with uh, a filtration system which incorporates a micro filtration membrane. And uh, this micro filtration membrane, uh, of course, separates uh, solid impurities, uh, bacteria, and similar from, uh, from the filtrate. And uh, in uh, production, at production scale, of course, the used filters uh, can be quite different. Uh, in geometry and in, in operation from those used in at laboratory scale. Although in, uh, from the uh, producer's uh, point of view, the both, both filters should, be, uh, should act uh, like uh, uh, similar, but in reality, there are some differences which can be uh, quite important for, uh, uh, for uh, a general, a general uh, let's say, question, which uh, is uh, how 
do we match, uh, let's say, uh, energy intake that uh, is uh, is uh, uh, incorporated in the in the membrane during operation at the at the production scale with this uh, energy intake at the laboratory scale, because at the laboratory scale we have to uh, be able to uh, to perform uh, validation cases and of course the conditions for these validation cases should be the same at the production as well as at the laboratory scale. And the main problem here is that uh, we have uh, quite large uh, scale differences, large differences in uh, volumes, in, in uh, volumetric flows. And uh, of course, this is one, uh, one part of the problem. And the other part is uh, the nature of the energy intake. Of course, uh, it, is, uh, it can be somehow uh, divided into uh, energy intake during uh, continuous flow and energy intake during uh, on-off uh, operation. That means uh, 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 opening and closing of uh, valves. And uh, this is also then linked to another problem, uh, which is uh, fouling of uh, membranes during uh, filtration operation. Of course, the membrane at the start uh, of the operation is clean. And then during the filtration, it starts to, to foul. And the, this has uh, quite a severe impact on the permeability of the membrane. And of course, also on the pressure uh, oscillations and uh, energy that uh, then at the end uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, absorbed by the membrane. Uh, next slide. So uh, we did this uh, study uh, two ways or two levels. One was purely experimental study, which served uh, also as a uh, validation, uh, validation uh, case uh, for uh, computational models, which were then the second level where we tried to, uh, to, get, to get more insight into the flow fields, pressure fields, especially uh, in such complex filtration systems. And as you can see on the right side, uh, during the valve operation, whether, whether this is closing or opening, in a very short time, in, in a few, uh, few tenths of the second, uh, there are uh, large pressure oscillations, which then uh, uh, protrude from, uh, from valve uh, uh, position to the position of the filter. And uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, pressure oscillation, of course, at the end uh, uh, affects uh, the filtration mechanisms inside the membrane. Next slide. Next slide, OK. Uh, here we can see also a computational uh, results uh, for one quite simple problem. It's a laboratory scale uh, filter. It's quite, it's quite small filter, uh, but uh, still the, the action of the moving pin uh, produces pressure waves. In this case, this is closing of the valve. And uh, these pressure waves uh, then, uh, then uh, produces uh, power, uh, power uh, waves or pressure power waves, which at the end, of course, hit the membrane. And a part of this uh, energy, energy is then absorbed by the membrane. And there is, as you will talk a bit uh, this later, there is a difference between whether this happens on the production or at the laboratory scale. Uh, next slide. So if you want to have a good computational model, then of course you have to understand how this fouling or how this, uh, this uh, membrane uh, uh, clogging is uh, 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 taking uh, place. And that's why at, before the start of this project, we did another study for Lake uh, where we developed uh, specially customi customized uh, models for, uh, for um, uh, main uh, fouling mechanisms that can be uh, uh, met in filtration uh, praxis. And this, uh, this software now uh, enables uh, the users in Lake to to uh, determine which fouling mechanism is taking place for a certain, let's say, combination of filter and of course uh, the, uh, the formulation that is filtered. 
So this was the first part. And with these models for uh, hydraulic permeability, one can then uh, proceed with uh, constructing a, a computational fluid dynamics model of uh, filtration. So next slide. And uh, when we have this uh, larger uh, models, uh, of course, then uh, it is uh, quite, uh, as you will see in, on the next slide, uh, it is quite important uh, to be able to uh, resolve uh, the true ge geometry of the filter. And then we have a problem because microfiltration membrane is only uh, 200 micrometers thick. And of course, you have to have a certain uh, mesh density within the membrane, of course, then also in channels that lead to this membrane and also that collect the filtrates at the exit of the membrane. And this leads to a very, very large computational models, uh, which, by, but at the end are then capable of uh, giving you a very exact uh, flow field and pressure fields uh, inside uh, such a device. And here in this uh, picture, we have uh, uh, look at the um, stacked filter case, uh, the production scale filter case, uh, where we can see that there are, let's say, 80 membranes in there. And of course, uh, one has to uh, be able to compute flow through such a complex uh, channel uh, system. Uh, next slide. Uh, the same uh, can be said also for pleated filter case, which is another uh, version of the uh, filtration uh, equipment. Um, also here, the membrane is of the same thickness. That means we have the same problems uh, with, uh, with generating uh, computational mesh and at the end also computing the solution. And typically this solution takes a few days to compute, especially when uh, one tries to, uh, to reproduce, let's say, um, uh, transient phenomena which happens when there are uh, pressure waves in this very, very short uh, physical time. Uh, next slide. Uh, here we can see the final results, let's say so, uh, flows in this, uh, at this uh, production scale. One can see from the second and fourth, uh, um, from, the from the left side uh, figure that the majority of the pressure drop uh, is uh, really uh, taking place across the membrane. And uh, of course, uh, with such 3D uh, computational models, one can then uh, really study whether there are some weak points uh, inside these uh, filtrations, uh, filtration membranes where one could probably due to geometrical reasons uh, 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 expect, let's say, some problems, but on, Mainly, these models now allow us to uh, have uh, 3D and uh, very, very exact uh, representation of pressures on the downstream and upstream uh, position of the membrane. And that means we can very accurately compute uh, the intensity, pressure intensity at the membrane, and of course, uh, consequently, also the energy intake. And uh, when we compared energy intakes computed by these uh, virtual or 3D models and uh, the ones that we uh, measured by experimental uh, approach, we established that this, uh, these values were, let's say, 90% or 85% corresponding, so which is uh, quite a good result. Next slide. And of course, the, the end result of uh, the project uh, that is also practically applicable is to have uh, some kind of, uh, let's say, simplified uh, model, which allows you to first uh, um, calculate uh, the uh, energy intake at the production level, and then uh, by uh, means of uh, the developed uh, uh, models uh, for energy intake at the lab level, also uh, establish uh, conditions at which uh, validation uh, at the laboratory level should be uh, should be uh, taken place in order to meet the same conditions as there are at the production scale. And we have several, we have developed, uh, I think, four such downscale models, uh, which are now, let's say, tested at the lake premises uh, in order to see uh, how this uh, work in uh, long-term, let's say, practice. 
So the results of the project are very encouraging and we are hoping to let's say, extend this uh, work also in the future. So this is mainly what I wanted to uh, report on this project. Thank you, Matthias. And yes. do you have any questions? Uh, so actually I have one. Uh, so thank you for this presentation. Uh, can this kind of project allow us to establish filter validations or bacterial retention tests in-house? Yeah, so um, hmm, yeah, right now the validations are done mainly externally. Uh, we know two big companies, uh, Merck and PAL, which support us. Uh, but uh, with really long waiting times uh, for new validations lately, uh, I think that uh, maybe there will be an urge to bring more knowledge about uh, filtering and validations inside and shorten the time for, for example, for this filter validation or bacterial retention, retention test. So, yeah, I think this uh, will be more and more popular in the future if this trend with more waiting times will, will be still uh, there in next year. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. And I see no questions from the audience. Uh, so with that, uh, I would conclude presentations from Biologics uh, Mingesh. So thank you uh, again to all the presenters. Uh, and for the next presentation, I would like to invite Clement Krift, so our host today too. So he's a researcher from the Faculty of Pharmacy and uh, the Sando Development Center. Clement will speak about the use of mixed reality in Novartis. Uh, joining him is Dr. Alesh Pustover, assistant professor from the Faculty of Economics. Alesh will describe the collaboration between Novartis and EAT Digital during the digital transformation for Organizational Resilience Summer School. Thank you, Matteo. Uh, and uh, welcome also Alesh. First, I would just like to make sure that my slides are visible. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Matea, for the warm introduction. Um, so yeah, today I'll speak about mixed reality and how we use it in Novartis to um, improve our day-to-day -day operations. Um, oh. I know many of you already know what mixed reality is, but for the others, um, let's put this on a spectrum first, this mixed reality on the spectrum of realities. So um, here on the left-hand side, we have our real environment. This is the world that we live in, that we sense with all, our, with, uh, all five of our senses. Um, and on the other hand of realities, we have virtual reality. This is a reality we can access with the virtual reality headset or goggles. And this place is completely digital and it basically replaces our real environment. Now, a merger of these two environments are augmented in mixed reality. So here we actually overlap some digital information over our real environment. And in case of augmented reality, we can see and observe this digital information, but we can't really interact with it. But with mixed reality, we can interact with this digital information, which means that we can 3D design certain virtual objects, or we can have meetings with uh, holograms of our associates, or we can play around with process data and visualize it as we like. And this kind of data is then overlapped over our uh, field of sight, over real environment. Now, how do we access uh, mixed reality uh, in Novartis? So we have approved standard solution and this is the Microsoft uh, HoloLens 2. This is basically a headset that we put on our head as can be seen here. And these glasses integrate seamlessly with Microsoft Teams. So this means that any user of uh, the HoloLens 2 can basically at any point interact with any other expert via a call via Microsoft Teams. 
Now, why would we even get into mixed reality? What's the benefit? So we all know usually the greater the distance, the harder it is for our associates to communicate and to collaborate. And uh, this is pretty common in, the, um, in a global company, let's say. And with the pandemic knocking on our door, these problems only exacerbated. So to improve that, we kind of turned to mixed reality. And um, on the other hand, we've also seen that um, virtual reality can um, facilitate the learning process compared to um, general SOP reading. So learning through virtual uh, or let's say VR simulations is a lot similar to real life training than SOP uh, reading. And based on the feedback that we are receiving from our associates, it's the same for mixed reality. Now I'd like to start with some of the use cases, how we use mixed reality in Novartis. So the first one is for training and standard operating procedures, something I call um, passive onboarding. So uh, let's say that there's an operator who can learn by himself or herself um, at, at, at any point without the need for the training manager to be present. So the operator can just take this uh, mixed reality glasses and some digital information appear in his field of sight. Like for example, a video tutorial on how a certain machine okay. is operated. And this is in a step-by-step -step process. Um, we also have, for example, some um, digital instructions which show the operator. Oh, sorry. Ah, I thought there was a question. Um, so we have some video instructions which basically tell us which item to pick up during the training procedure or which button to press or when a certain item is stored and this very much facilitates the learning process of our associates the next uh, use case that i would like to point out we can also pull up some um, process data or um, let's say a past batch that was uh, manufactured. And we can, for an easier uh, understanding of the process, check this data or for the ease of scale up, check this, or we can also um, use it for a process transfer to another country to show some material to other operators how a process should look like. And on this topic, uh, I would also like to mention that we have used during the pandemic uh, mixed reality quite extensively to facilitate the process transfer and analytical method transfer to other countries. Um, you know, it's much easier to just send a mixed reality headset to another country where the operator of that country puts the headset on and our associate can remotely from home advise him what and how to do it. And um, if this well, this pandemic has actually shown us that our associates can um, do process analy and, and uh, analytical method transfer at least as good as doing it in person in another country. And uh, lastly, we've used it for virtual meetings and remote audits. So um, actually, uh, I believe this was in Mingush, where they performed um, um, an external audit remotely where our um, managers would wear the um, mixed reality headset and our external auditors would see the field of vision of our uh, operators or managers which would show them around the site and show them how we do what we do. Now, uh, these were only some of the use cases but we have recognized the potential of mixed reality to kind of use it beyond the scope of just duration of the pandemic, because some of these use cases were pretty specific to the pandemic. So we developed one tool for all our needs. And this is the project vision, which basically um, works to improve communication, collaboration, and day-to-day -day operations. It is basically a platform in the digital world with four um, options to select. We have the remote ass assistance, button which um, helps us or which gets us an access uh, to, to, to an expert for something. And then we have dynamics guides for this training and passive onboarding and so on. And then we also have here uh, some um, 
QR codes. And these QR codes can be scanned via these mixed reality glasses and then some digital information would appear. And the idea is, is to put these QR codes throughout our laboratory facilities. And when the operator would come, let's say to a certain machine, he could just scan this QR code and some information about how this machine would function um, or um, some yeah, other information would appear. Um, but we know that we're not the only experts on mixed reality. There, there's much more talent out there uh, who know much more about mixed reality and virtual reality than we do. Uh, so that's why we decided to partner with EIT Digital. Specifically, we became um, case providers for their summer school. And now I would like to invite Dr. Aleš Kustovark from the Faculty of, e of Economics at the University of Ljubljana to uh, present our collaboration with him. Uh, thank you, Clement. Uh, thanks a lot for the, for the introduction. Uh, just to confirm, you can all hear me. Is that correct? Yes. Perfect. Um, I didn't prepare any slides because I want to talk about the story. And, and the story actually starts three years ago when, um, when University of Ljubljana became a partner of EAT Digital. And EAT stands for European Institute of Innovation and Technology. So all of you guys, or a lot of you guys, are familiar with Horizon Projects, which is the main European program for financing research and development. I think right now they have something like 80 billion euros of financing available for research. Well, European Institute of Technology is the second biggest program of the European Union, but that one is, is focused much more on, on financing um, entrepreneurship or financing the, the um, connections between research, teaching, and new company creation and new business creation. Okay, And for that reason, it is always organized as a network of different partners. There are some in, in particular case of EAT Digital, there are some 20 universities, but altogether, I think more than 200 different companies and other organizations. Uh, EAT Digital, uh, I must say, is only one of the different uh, areas that they cover. There is also EAT Health. Right now, EAT Urban Mobility is starting, and in the future, uh, creative industries are also starting. All of these different EATs are organized in different industries, so they are industry specific. And at the same time, their intention is very simple. They want to connect um, big companies, small companies, universities, and students and, and people in general um, on, on very particular goals to enhance and to improve the collaboration in research and development in Europe. Their main goal actually is commercialization of research and creating new successful companies in Europe. So what EIT Digital does, among other things, is they try and they, they um, educate a lot of students. They have a master's program, they have a doctoral program, and they also have a summer school. University of Ljubljana School of Economics and Business here has been implementing the summer school for AT Digital students for the last three years in the field of connecting entrepreneurship and digital technologies. Unfortunately, only the first year was live. It was a very, very interesting on-site here in Ljubljana. The next two years were both organized in a virtual capacity using all the tools that we are very familiar now already. Um, but I must say it was still pretty interesting because we put together a group of 20 plus students from all over the world. And these are some of the best students that we work with. They, they come from uh, almost every big country you can imagine. And they, we put them together with Slovenian students and they form groups. And for two weeks, these groups are, you know, solving specific problems, solving specific challenges. Novartis has, um, in both of the last two years, contributed to challenges. And one of the challenges actually was the mixed reality. So there was a group of students from all over the world working on on solving the challenge of how to, to use the technology, the mixed reality technology, to enhance and, and you know, improve the business capacity um, and the innovation capacity of Novartis. The reality is that every single time after the two weeks of this summer school, we are always surprised how good solutions uh, students can actually come up with. Um, very interestingly, they don't have to be in the same room. They can be, you know, basically these students have never met before 
And still, if the challenge is well prepared, and Novartis challenges are always very well prepared, uh, they can come up with, with some really, really good solutions. And these solutions are then um, you know, available to companies. And hopefully, the companies, and Novartis in particular, will then actually implement these ideas, these solutions presented by the students. But the second benefit is also that these students, again, these are some of the best students that we encounter, and, and we see a lot of students at the University of Ljubljana. Uh, they, first of all, uh, get to know Novartis, they get to know the, the specific areas of research and, and entrepreneurship that you're working on. But also, they are some of them are quite motivated to uh, actually join, uh, you know, join your company. So I do believe there is a lot of potential and, and in, to further collaboration. Uh, we already know that we're going to have the next summer school next year. Hopefully, this time it's going to be live again. And this kind of collaboration with different institutions, different students across you know, whole Europe is a typical example of open innovation system. And I'm very happy that Novartis is actually recognizing this as a very, very good opportunity um, to, to expand the reach beyond the borders of the company. I don't know, Clement, if you wanted me to talk more about the specific mixed reality challenge or uh, was this general background enough? Uh, I think it was okay. Um, I would just like to also mention that we are looking forward to uh, the future EIT digital summer schools and that we've always been very um, happy or satisfied with the solutions that these students um, and provide that. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to our future collaboration as well. Another interesting uh, thing that is happening after the summer schools is not only that the, the companies are being connected to the students, but also that all the companies that are providing challenges here, Novartis being usually one of 10 different companies that do so, are, you know, getting to know each other. And, and all of these companies are, you know, facing somewhat similar challenges. So now you also have for example, you, you can, uh, you know, you can collaborate with Danfoss, for example, who was providing one additional challenge there. Um, and, and they know exactly the, the, the field and, you know, the, the problem space um, that they're in, that you are in. So I think that one um, surprising consequence of this summer school was actually more collaboration also between different companies. Of course, these summer schools are taking place across Europe at the same time as we have one in Ljubljana. There are 10 or I think 11 additional ones happening in different cities across Europe. And uh, usually, I mean, this year, I think that Ljubljana summer school was the second best summer school uh, there, which only means that we have one spot to improve next year. <laughs> That's great to hear. Looking forward to, yeah, to the next one. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Uh, and Alesh also made a very good introduction to EIT Health as well, because I now don't need to explain what it is. Well, basically, it's an, in, in a, an innovation consortium of big, small companies, universities, startups, and various experts on the topic of health innovation. And we've actually joined with them uh, as well. And together, I have to point out with the Ljubljana University Incubator in um, uh, organizing a hackathon again on the topic of of mixed reality, where we will again search for um, solutions that we hadn't thought of yet, or that um, we we just don't see at this moment. And with this uh, collaboration, uh, we believe that we will find some new solutions for implementation. So, uh, as you can see. Um, we are heavily kind of focusing on mixed reality because we see its potential not only um, to use it during the pandemic, but also beyond. And um, for some people, it might be scary because, you know, it's a new technology, it might be hard to implement it, and it kind of also could replace some of the work that our associates are doing. But if the pandemic has taught us anything is that um, we always desire or crave that, um, yeah, we crave for that human touch, for that uh, social interaction. And mixed reality um, cannot give it on its own. It has, it's only a medium that's transferred that. So I believe that um, for us in the foreseeable future, uh, mixed reality is a, only, let's say, a tool in our arsenal to approve our communication, collaboration, and day-to-day -day operations. 
Um, and with this, I would like to conclude uh, this presentation and thank again Alesh for um, also jumping in. Thank you, Clemen and Alesh, for this uh, great presentation. Uh, so, Clemen, you talked about scanning QR codes with the HoloLens headset to obtain additional digital information. Can you elaborate with an example how this would work in a pharmaceutical manufacturing facility? Yeah, thank you, Mateo. That's a, that's a great question. So um, imagine that you have in your laboratory many of these QR codes for every possible yeah, machine or, or application. And um, the idea is, or our next step would be now, is to put these QR codes next to machines and then get an expert who would, with his uh, mobile phone, uh, get a selfie and scan his face. And based on that, make an avatar of himself so that in the digital world, um, or in the mixed reality world, he would then explain uh, how something works. And then as, as an additional options in these QR codes, we could also store um, inside some PDFs or some leaflets or some additional documents, which could be useful for our operators to know how a certain device functions. Uh, and in the background, we um, um, are trying to basically do a text to speech conversion, so that the um, so that the 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 avatar is explaining from the text, so that no voice needs to be recorded. And in this way, we think that uh, our associates would have would have a much um, a much better way of you know, uh, operating uh, laboratory or devices. And this also again applies to manufacturing facilities as well. Thank you. Thank you, Matea, as well. Now um, for our last speaker, and Alesh, um, thank you very much again for joining. Um, for our last speaker, I would like to invite uh, Giga Perco. Head of Continuous Performance Improvement and a member of the leadership team, uh, team in Sando Development Center. Giga's talk will be on the topic of reimagining drug development in Novartis with data and digital technologies. Giga, this will be very interesting. Please go ahead. All right. Um, thanks a lot, Clement, for the introduction. Really excited to be here. Um, excellent examples that we've seen throughout the event today um, and I'm also personally uh, very enthusiastic about the future that will ensue from the projects um, that we've seen also the vision that you shared with us uh, I think the future holds a lot of exciting opportunities for us in the industry as well as everybody in the academia area right and then giving us an opportunity to join our forces and hopefully reimagine how uh, drug development is done, right? And this is the area that I would like to focus on uh, today a bit more as well. So um, instead of focusing on everything that has been done so far, I would like to give us an outlook into what's coming, what we are focusing on in uh, Novartis and how we can really leverage uh, data, digital technologies to change um, say our operating model or at least how we were approaching um, drug development or generic drug development in uh, the past. So I know that the pharmaceutical industry has this uh, maybe tag that historically we've been lagging in the adoption of digital technologies, uh, but in Novartis and, and Sandoz, so the generic division of Novartis, we are working really hard um, to change this. Um, what we've seen in, in the past century is really an incredible um, progress, we can say, uh, from the discovery of penicillin prior to the World War II uh, um, uh, times, all the way to, we could call them, uh, pharmacological miracles of the, for example, cell and gene therapies that came to market in, in recent years. And both Novartis as well as Sandoz 
have played key roles in, in this story. Um, sandals, especially, you know, from discovering of the first oral penicillins uh, all the way to uh, first biosimilars that we've also heard about um, today. And as a community, uh, we've made huge strides um, towards improving um, the access um, to healthcare, uh, but we really haven't solved um, the access issue completely, right? If we, if we look at the World Health uh, Organization, they are estimating that over 2 billion people still lack access to um, the therapies they need. And this is not the case only in developing countries, uh, but also across um, developed world, right? So we are seeing this trend of growing um, healthcare costs and this absolutely impacts um, access everywhere. And what plays a big role in combating this is the off-patent competition. Um, this is probably the single greatest contributor to driving the uh, healthcare uh, budget savings and increasing access um, uh, to needed um, medicines. And if we look, uh, for example, to Europe, um, there was a study done by our trade association um, that showed that generic uh, alternatives allow twice as many patients to access key uh, medicines for, for the same budget, right? So this really shows the impact that generic industries have on patients' lives. And when we're talking about patients, they are really at the center of our um, purpose. So pioneering access for uh, patients, this is quite simply the reason uh, why we exist. And it's a driving for behind um, our strategy and behind everything uh, we do. And to put you know, our uh, purpose and our strategy into practice, uh, here at Sanus, we have um, over 20,000 really talented colleagues across the world with you know, impressive commitment to each other and to our culture uh, to really um, drive this access to new generic medicines uh, for patients. And together with that and with our ambition to become a leading and most valued generic um, company, we see digital you know, as a key enabler to help us uh, achieve this, um, to help us realize um, um, our uh, purpose um, and enable uh, our products to be uh, available to as many patients across um, the globe. Now, what we've seen in, in the last 100 years is really um, a consistent development of uh, our industry that resulted in, uh, I believe, over 7,000 medicines being developed and uh, available um, to those that uh, need them. Um, also, we've seen a rise of you know, our own generic um, industry. And, you know, this trend of um, continuous development and growth is, of course, continuing. Um, but what is even more fascinating, perhaps, is that we are seeing, um, let's say, in the past few decades, um, uh, a really exponential growth of the um, data and digital uh, segment. Um, and, and to put this uh, digital revolution in, in perspective, for example, um, that's been driven also by the explosion of big data. Um, in the past two years, for example, 90% of the uh, world's data has been created. Right? There is um, an estimation that each of us creates two megabytes of data every second. Right? So those numbers are um, sometimes mind-boggling and difficult to imagine. Um, but that's how much data we are uh, generating um, these days. And this, of course, has a big uh, impact on a number of industries, and pharmaceutical industry is no exceptions. And we see that digital is driving a big paradigm shift, right? So we see uh, a rise of automation about, and, and rise of machine learning. 
And this has a big impact on manual tasks, on re repetitive tasks. Um, we see a focus on customers, so customer centricity. Um, um, and, and this is shaping then business models of, of different companies. Uh, there are a lot of um, companies that rose with this digital explosion and enable to um, develop new business models, um, uh, new expectations to how the products should look like, um, how quickly they should reach um, the, uh, the users or what are the life cycles. So um, a big impact on um, industries uh, all over the world. And as I mentioned in the beginning, we've seen that um, pharmaceutical industry perhaps has not capitalized on this opportunity in the past as much as others. And if we think about the words that I shared with you in the beginning, right? I believe there are 2 billion reasons uh, why we need to change this. And digital for us, means asking big and powerful uh, what if uh, questions uh, that can help us launch new products sooner and more efficiently. Now, if we're talking about our development teams, that means you know asking how we can save time and focus on value added tasks, right? How we can get insights from this huge amount of um, R&D data that we have. Uh, um, in, in our hands, or um, how can we use connected data for automated regulatory file submission, right? So those are all big and very important questions that can ultimately lead to um, transformation of how new generic products are developed. What I would like to share with you now is a quick glimpse of how the development process of a generic drug looks like. Uh, what is characteristic of, for example, um, product uh, generic product development and sa at Sandals is that there is a broad pipeline. We are covering um, practically all therapeutic areas. There is a high number of um, uh, projects in development. And this also results in high throughput in terms of the new submissions um, or launches of products. We could segment our development process into four key um, categories. The first one is preparation phase, uh, where we are evaluating the product that we want to um, develop and set the strategy for the development. Um, then we start with the laboratory development. So that means uh, developing the formulation, the analytical methods, uh, which will be used to ensure uh, uh, that we can prove that our product is uh, bioequivalent to the reference innovative medicine. Um, in the submission phase, what we are doing is transferring the product from our laboratory scale to manufacturing scale, um, testing stability, and also conducting bioequivalent studies um, to show uh, equivalence. And after we have a re regulatory file uh, compiled, we um, submit it to the health authorities for review um, and, pre and start preparing for launch. Now, and during each phase of the development, there are a number of opportunities that um, we can uh, address with data and digital technology and make this uh, process even more uh, efficient and reduce the timelines uh, from uh, five to 10 years um, that it takes currently to launch a new generic drug from beginning um, to uh, uh, something uh, much shorter. And when we're talking about our digital strategy, uh, what is important is to keep in mind that we are not doing this because uh, just for the sake of it, but we really want to deliver new generic products um, to patients in a large number of countries 
to drive access to, to these medicines. And for us, digital strategy is based on three areas. And I'll start with the first one, which is our core um, data uh, platforms that enable us um, end-to-end um, digital workflows and, and data management. And this is really important because we've seen data today is, is, is everything and you do need a system to digitize your operations to capture um, the data and make it available for um, subsequent uh, use. The next layer of our digital strategy is smart operation, which involves um, primarily automation, anything from uh, robotization of lab equipment to uh, process automation, uh, also in other segments of um, the development and um, our processes. And last but not least, once everything is in place, uh, we focus on in silico development. So that means using novel and disruptive approaches we're using in silico modeling to replace uh, par partially or completely um, experimental work that was traditionally done in laboratories. Um, for the last few minutes, what I would like to do is share six examples of how we are applying um, our digital strategy in in, in, in reimagining re generic um, drug development. Um, and if we start, first of all, with um, our laboratories, uh, what is key here is for us to ensure that we have state-of-the-art um, equipment that can enable us to interconnect it, leverage the data that it um, generates and plug it into our um, digital uh, workflows. Um, what works in connection to this is uh, also lab automation. We've seen some examples already um, today, uh, but in the last few years, we've really invested a lot in the automation of our analytical uh, activities. So uh, installing and also developing a laboratory equipment that can automate some of those um, repetitive or sometimes tedious um, or, or, or um, dangerous uh, activities from a health and safety perspective and with this increase our capacity. Uh, we've also um, created an internal team uh, that we call Digital Lab to help us uh, develop a proof of concept solution and in a quick and iterative way, we really address the needs of our teams uh, for um, you know, new digital uh, tools. And what they have developed is um, uh, software that help us leverage the data uh, that was generated during the experiments and then be automatically populated into the report. So with this, we are saving uh, the time for our researchers and um, uh, automating the entire process of uh, creating a report. Next area that has been extensively highlighted today uh, already is augmented reality. So I think there's uh, no need for me to um, go much more in details because Clement did an amazing job explaining how we are using this uh, technology to bring our scientists across the globe uh, closer um, together. Um, then we have um, digital lab uh, workflow platform that we use to bring um, uh, different lab equipment um, and our uh, experiment creation management and all the data that's being created um, during an experiment into one digital platform and repository. So in the beginning, you've seen a balance. So when something is being weighted, um, the data is then automatically um, uh, collected in the system. And this works for all different types of equipment, 
and is a big breakthrough that we have implemented or are implementing um, at the moment. And last but not least, it's data science and in silico modeling. With this, you know, we are really talking about the next generation of development and um, what we have developed so far. And what you can see here is a uh, solution that help us uh, model different physical and process parameters of our products and see how this will impact, uh, for example, um, the in vivo or in vitro uh, results and, and see whether we are being close to um, the reference product. So to conclude, what I would really like for you is to stay curious, um, challenge the status quo because there is so much opportunity ahead of us and data and digital is really unlocking it. I hope that we will use this opportunity to get today to get connected so that we can address some of those uh, challenges together in partnerships between academia and industry. And I'd also like to um, inspire you that you consider collaboration with healthcare and pharmaceutical industry and possibly even us in the future. So with this, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, thank you, Jigo, um, very, very much. This was very insightful. Um, in the chat, I'm checking, there are no questions. So I would have one for you. So you are kind of um, here in the Sando Development Center, you're kind of pioneering dig digital uh, transformation. And we all know that when we are uh, trying to introduce such um, yeah digital tools, it can be challenging because people uh, tend to resist change. Uh, have you experienced any um, resistance from associates when you are implementing this novel digital tool? Uh, thank you, Clement, for the question. I think that's a very relevant question. And as we know, uh, change is not easy and we all always have those early adopters who are very quick at adopting new solutions, new approaches, and perhaps uh, a majority that is a bit slower, a bit more hesitant, and require a bit more convincing. So, um, of course, we have faced this in, in the past and are facing it uh, also at the moment. Uh, whenever we are introducing some, something that is really novel, um, at least in its early phases, we know that there are perhaps some challenges um, and uh, maybe downsides compared to a uh, traditional or legacy uh, approach. And uh, what we found that what is the best way to, to tackle this is involving our users early on, listening to, to their feedback and um, improving it in iterations. I think that gives them the confidence that they are being heard, that we are here to um, address the needs that they have, support them along the process. Um, and once we get this critical mass going, I think others are then follow quite quickly. Um, but being focused on the users, making their lives easier, I think that this is the key um, to um, accelerate adoption of new tools or new approaches. Thank you, Jiga. This was an, an excellent uh, answer. Um, and yeah, with this, uh, we are wrapping up the third Novartis Researcher Day. Uh, I'm sure you agree that it was an insightful event and we would like to thank again all of the speakers and participants who celebrated our achievements today, uh, especially thanks to our academic partners who are making this cutting edge research possible. Uh, we are looking forward to future brilliant academic collaborations and hopefully we'll be able to host many more Novartis Researchers Days. Thank you very much also from my side. I really want to thank everybody for your time and sharing all these wonderful examples of academia industry collaboration in concrete projects. I would also like to thank Uni Minds organizing committee and also Dr. Daria Frocheta Meliotto from Novartis for organizing this event uh, that we can share our best practices. Um, and uh, to bring together all these innovative minds from two students to industrial partners. 
So our future development is strongly, strongly connected to academia and events such as this, they help us to collaborate even better together. So uh, I will finish there and invite you also to join UniMinds event uh, also tomorrow. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thanks.